Welcome to the Command Post Podcast, powered by First Do. I'm your host, Tom Lewis, First Do's Enterprise Training Manager. I am very pleased today to welcome the United States Fire Administrator, Dr. Lori Moore Merrill, to our podcast today. Dr. Moore was appointed by President Biden as the United States Fire Administrator on October 25th, 2021. Prior to her appointment, she served nearly three years as the President and CEO of the International Public Safety Data Institute, which she founded after retiring from a 26-year tenure as a senior executive in the International Association of Firefighters. She started her fire service career in 1987 as a fire department paramedic in the city of Memphis, Tennessee. Today, as a doctor of public health and data scientist, Dr. Moore is an award-winning international speaker, presenter, and author. She is an expert in executive leadership, community risk assessment, emergency response system evaluation, public safety resource deployment, firefighter health and safety, and generational differences in the workplace. I'm very grateful to have her on today's podcast. Let's get this started. Well, Dr. Moore, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on the Command Post podcast today. I'm very grateful to you uh, for taking time and uh, excited to talk with you. But before we do, congratulations on your new position. And how's it been going since your appointment? Uh, well, thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, and I'm excited to be here. So it has been, um, it's going well. It has been an adventure. So I'm just over three months in the seat. And I can tell you that you know, at the at the beginning, it was a bit overwhelming. Um, I often say, you know, you've heard drinking from a fire hose. I said, no, this was straight off the hydrant. So, um, <laughs> right, so it has been uh, uh, quite the learning experience and trying to comprehend uh, as much as possible. So, um, on an adventure. So, I'm excited about it. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So, you know, that's 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 you know the pinnacle of of a fire service career is to be able to be the United States Fire Administrator. But kind of share just a little bit about how you got there, you know, your journey there. Wow. Um, so it has been quite the journey. I have been in the fire service um, in some capacity for the last 35 years. Wow. So I hate saying that because it sounds like, oh my, just how old are you? Um, so <laughs> I actually went on the job uh, in Memphis, Tennessee back in 1987. So I was a fire paramedic there for seven years uh, before being recruited to the IAFF uh, in 1993. And I spent my time as an EMS specialist to start at the IFF and then uh, grew um, to become the head of what we call technical assistance, which was really research. And right. so, uh, in that capacity, I worked with a lot of other organizations and I've tried to maintain a, you know, um, a team building approach that you know, we do things better together as uh, you know, fire service, whether it's labor management, um, you know, leadership, I think is better if we are trying to lead together. And so in that capacity, um, made a lot of relationships at the IFF and um, 26 years there. And as I uh, departed in a lot of the research um, that I had done at the IFF, I was able to take with me and to stand up a new data institute. And so for the last uh, prior to my appointment, the last three years, we're committed to really standing up uh, the Data Institute and perpetuating data tools uh, for the fire services used to make sure that they had their data at the local level. And then, of course, uh, from there, I was appointed here in uh, October of 2021 by President Biden. So I'm really honored um, to be sitting here right now. Well, it's good. It's good to, to have you in this position. And I know, um, as you mentioned, you're very passionate about data. You always have been. Um, I know our paths have crossed many times at different conferences, from SIPSI to FDIC to the you know Vision 2020. And so, data plays an important role, very important role in the fire service. But what is, what is your vision for not just how we're collecting data, but how we can take trustworthy right? And I think that's a, a, an important. Um, adjective here as far as what, you know, there's data and there's data and there's data, but we need trustworthy, actionable data um, and intelligence that can be extracted from it. So share a little bit about your vision um, when it comes to the role data plays, of course, and then how we can get that meaningful intelligence out. 
So that's a great question. Yes, I am very passionate about data, as you say. And um, one of the things that we have to understand is that today, there's almost no decision that's made outside of a data source and having intelligence from mining information. And if you do, it's typically the decision is, is not likely to be a good one only, you know, by happenstance, if that's the case. So data do play a, a prominent role in what we are doing, particularly in the fire and emergency services. And so one of the things that I think is important for people to understand is that you know, we've relied historically on a single data source. And we, you know, have been able to talk about in the fire service, fire and EMS services, you know, how many calls we made, what type of call, how fast we got there. And we lived on that for a very long time, as if that was enough. And we have reached a time where, you know, and not just now, but years past, where that wasn't enough. And a single data source today is no longer enough. So it's not just a limited of data variables, but it's a limitation of data sources as well. Okay. We are not prepared to pull in multiple sources and, you know, aggregate data and then mine it for intelligence, actionable, as you said, intelligence, um, then we're going to be lost. And, and so I think that that is, has to maintain our focus and, and, I think you're spot on. I mean, data is the new oil. Uh, some say data is the new bacon. You're a bacon lover, right? So uh, we have to. <laughs> oh, have, and I am. <laughs> so data, data is uh, is going to drive uh, not just today, but going forward. Yeah. So you mentioned that single data source. I believe you're meant you're referring to Enfers. That, that yes. kind of, that single that single data source um, and and again a lot of departments you know with the different vendors out there they're 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 capturing a lot of data on other aspects of their fire department operations but um, Enfers is I know near and dear to you um, uh, as and and because as you mentioned it captured a lot of our response data right and so you're in a position now that um, the future of Enfers may be changing so if if you were to and I'm sure it's going to be a core part of your role and, of course, your vision um, as the United States Fire Administrator. So uh, what's in our future when it comes to Enfers as, as you see it in your vision and in your new role? Uh, um, great question. Well, yes, um, I have evaluated Enfers for the last probably 15 years uh, or more. But just talking about Enfers as a data source, um, you know, we've tried over time to use it and the fire service has tried to use it and we've done so uh, relatively uh, effectively. And what I mean by that is it's all we had. And right. so analyzing it and having reports from it, um, you know, those, those have come about, right? Um, all the national organizations have used it, everybody from USFA to NFPA to the IFF, the IFC and many others have used it because it's all we had. And until you begin to dig down into those data and really understand the lack of quality and consistency mm -hmm. and timeliness of the data set, um, you don't see, um, you know, the, the forest for the trees kind of, kind of situation. Sure. Mm -hmm. We assume that it is good data. Well, that assumption really can get us in trouble because, quite frankly, we don't know what we don't know in the fire service. And, and again, it was the best we had. Did we get some intelligence out of it? Probably yes. Was it the best? I assure you, no. Because um, you can talk with any firefighter in this country. And I have done this again uh, for many, many years, standing in front of firefighters, speaking about the concept of data. And I'll say to them, how many of you, uh, you know, just click whatever button you can to make sure another window doesn't open up and you put the data in just to get through it and get to the end so you can hit submit. And you'll see head shaking and laughing and smirking and, and mm -hmm. that takes place. So we know the data that are imputed by firefighters, you know, uh, God bless them, they don't do it very well. And part of that is on, you know, the fact that they've not been trained in not only the data submission or input, but also in the value, right? right. Where does data reside in its value um, to the fire service. And we haven't taught that well. We haven't depended on that well until the last few years. And so all of these things have contributed um, to some of the 
we'll call them warts, on the, the current legacy system. So INFERS has not actually been touched um, since 2002. Mm. The INFERS, INFERS 5.0, really 1995, yep. we'll that, right? Um, and so we are talking, I mean, just think for a moment, how much technology advances you've had in the last two years, three sure. years. Let sure. alone the last 20. And so it is time for us to move from a legacy um, system that resides on hard servers to a cloud-based system. Oh. So yes, we are proposing and I'm working uh, very hard <laughs> to move forward with modernization of the current legacy system, which means we're not fixing anything. We're going to build a new cloud-based system. And so this is something that is happening across uh, the federal government, certainly in Homeland Security, where we are standing up cloud-based systems in all of our data systems. So INFERS is going to be one of those. And so as we build this new system, it'll become a series of you know, APIs. It'll become where we can connect, as I mentioned earlier, about various data sources. We need input from you know, things like the weather. We need geography. We need, you know, many other data inputs to aggregate with our response data and then mine that for intelligence. And so that's the concept is that we'll build a cloud-based system with multiple APIs for varied data sources um, and then be able to turn around interactive type dashboards back to local departments and states for their use. And so that they have it in a much more near real-time capability for this kind of intelligence. So that is the, the technology side of INFERS and where we are looking to go. And of course, we're gonna be doing a lot more talking about this, um, a lot more opportunity for interaction with the fire service because there's actually another piece. And the other piece is, it's not just the technology, but it's the data set itself. Right now, INFERS 5.0 is completely unwieldy. And I think you would agree with me on that, right? It has uh, questions that you know are never answered, honestly. And so we have to hone this data set to the must have information. What is the reality of what we actually need to make intelligent decisions at the local state and national level regarding fire and EMS? And so we've got to hone that to our, our must have. And so we're gonna be streamlining that data set overall, collapsing some of the categories, um, to a much higher level and, uh, and have a much more streamlined capability. That will do two things. Reduce, first of all, um, the data input by firefighters, right? Okay. If we get better technology, APIs, then I can reduce firefighter data input, which gets me better quality data right off the bat and reduces the burden to them, uh, right? So, so that's it. Reducing the burden, better quality. Those are our, our first two main outputs. So yeah, fewer key fewer clicks and keystrokes. And I know from, you know, my time in the fire service, 26 years, and then spending, you know, 10 years in um, the software records management um, soft, uh, software for fire departments. Um, part of what our mission was, was always to not only teach the product, right. But also to put Enfer's instruction involved, because that was something that was lacking. I remember your, some of your stories made me laugh. Um, significant municipal, large municipal agencies, and we're firefighters, so we're going to do this. But the story that sticks out to me was when you said, sure, they're going to select the 113 cooking fire. Why? Because in the structure fire module doesn't open up and it's less data to enter, just like you mentioned, you know, less clicks and keystrokes and firefighters will find a way to do less when it comes to something that is not necessarily a joyful part of the job, right? And putting, you know, as we say, putting the wet stuff on the red stuff and extrication and all the things that we got into the business for, but the data is an important part. And you mentioned also why we're doing it. I think that was always an element we tried to ex express as well, um, the whys behind it. But um, this vision sounds compelling. It sounds exciting. Um, for our listeners and viewers, explain just a little bit about the term API. Mm. So um, API is basically a data exchange pathway. That's a good question. And I, I'm sorry, I just use it. Uh, no, no, we, and, and in the industry, we know it, but not everybody yes, might know what it is. I always think absolutely. of it as systems, other disparate systems being able to talk and share data with each other, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So it's an application program interface is what API stands for. And it is, as you just said, it's a data exchange pathway so that we can push and pull data in an encrypted, uh, protected 
a secure manner. And so these APIs allow us to move data, um, as I said, securely getting it to another resting point for analytics and, and those sorts of things. So uh, basically a data exchange pathway. Right, right. And so you also mentioned near real time. So right now, when we submit NFERS, like say monthly NFERS reports, it's through a text file now, right? Mm -hmm. A carrot delimited in text file. Anybody who's looked at those files and either had to parse them. Painfully, yes, that is the case. <laughs> so so how, so tell, just briefly, how's that going to be different now with an API and how the, the, the how it's going to expedite things? So right now, as you said, moving text files um, and the unfortunate part is that as we move them, often data points are lost. And what I mean by that is that sometimes you'll have local fire departments use one vendor and you'll have a state you know, office where they're pushing the data who may use another vendor. Sure. So there's some variance in our, our vendor um, environment. And so given that, sometimes um, if you have a data point that doesn't fit through a gate to be received at another area or another level, then certain data points can be hard-coded either to unknown or hard-coded to zero. Yep. So these are some of the things that are taking place as the data moves through the system. And that can happen even again as it gets to us at the national level and moves into you know, the NFIRST system. And so that's part of the, the contributing factor to why we have so many unknowns. And I often say this anecdotally to people who don't understand um, our data problem. And I'll say, do you know what the number one type of fire is in the US? And they'll say, you know, it's your residential fires, whatever. No, no, it's a no, right? Oh. That's the result of our data problem, right? And so this is a this is this is why we can't even tell our own story to be able to, you know, ask for more resources mm. or make sure we're matching resources to the risk environment, because we simply can't tell, you know, our story about our data and because of that kind of scenario. And that's just one piece of, of that unknown problem. But when it, um, the data, you know, gets through the system via an API, it's much different. It means we're going to take it off the source. And so what I would love to see is to be able to hook directly with a CAD system, right? And take a data feed directly off CAD or a data push, right? Via API off of a CAD system. Now, that data is coming through a pipeline that goes directly into an, a new, and I don't know if we're going to call it infers or what yet, but our new infers um, data set. And then it's a, immediately available for analytics, right? Mm. No delay of pushing it to you know, the state and then up here, and it's got to make it through all these gates and then be cleaned and assessed for two years, mind you. Right. I remember you telling me that two, right? we're two, two years behind the data because it has to be, because of the quality, there's so much work that has to go into um, analyzing it to ensure it's considered valid and something that can be, you know, put in a paper, right? Put in a study. Correct. Correct. So even today, I mean, you had imagine that with the fires that we've had so far, even this year, and, you know, the, the unfortunately, how many fire deaths we've already had this year, those numbers that we report often are not coming from the inverse data set because right now we're only quoting from 2019. Right. Okay. Ask me about this month. I have to take it from a media scraping that we do, right, to be able to answer that. So that's a problem, right? I can't even, as a fire administrator, talk about our fire problem because the data I'm going to be quoting from is two years old. Well, I need to know about the fire problem now. Same thing with wildland. Right. You asked me about wildland data in the infers data set. It's almost doesn't exist. Right. Right. Because we are either it's not being inputted that way or we're looking at structure fires that were part of a wooey. Right. And we can't <laughs> gather because the data is so poor. And so when I'm asked as part of our whole um, the wildland and wildland urban interface interaction that we have um, with our counterparts and other parts of federal government. They're bringing data from right now. I mean, I literally met with people yesterday that are showing us live data feeds from anything that's burning right now. And I can't give them any operational assets that are being involved in that because we don't have the data. Mm. Right? So this is what I mean with an API, we would have real-time information or near real-time. It wouldn't be, you know, right now, but it may be, you know, 30 seconds to five minutes, but it is near real-time. So I can now assess operational engagement 
at these fires that, you know, USDA is telling me is occurring in the WUI. Yeah. So you're, you got DOD, you got USDA, you've got these other, you're in the same room with these people and they're giving you near real time. And you're sitting there from the fire administration representing our community and kind of it's probably sheep, sheepishly, <laughs> sheepishly sitting there going, mm, I don't have anything for you right now. It's exactly. And I, I, I have to say that. I have to say that we are the missing piece to that entire puzzle. We are the missing piece. And that is the operational piece, right, of what occurred and what deployed to those fires and what are the firefighters doing on scene? Well, how effective were they? You know, those are that's the missing piece. And often it comes, you know, after the fact when we can actually talk to the department and, and find out. But to get the data from that event, if it were occurring now, you're looking at two years for us to be able to report on that. And that's too late. Well, and so in some of those unfortunate, dramatically and, and sad, unfortunate fires in both New York and Philadelphia recently that you alluded to. So what you're saying is now with a potential new system coming online, I could theoretically as a fire chief, once that incident report is documented, and again, you're collecting data after the incident for some time, right? But not months, months necessarily. I could, in theory, submit that incident to you for analysis within days or, or even hours of that incident. Is that is that what I'm hearing? That is correct. Via an API, you would be able to push that data. And as soon as we receive it, it would be immediately available uh, for analytics. And so our um, vision right now, and again, we are the very early stages, so I don't want anybody to think no, no. this is happening. We're very early stages of setting the pathway and identifying funding, obviously, um, to be able to move to a much more modernized system with this kind of capability where we could have much more near real time analytics available. And it wouldn't just be available to us. It would be available to the local fire department right. data, right, who is, is feeding the data into the system in their own dashboards, in their own kind of, you know, accounts um, that they would have on the new system to be able to look at their own analytics and, and have that capability. The same thing for the states, um, that the states, you know, will continue to have a role and they would be able to look at the data, um, you know, within their realm as well. Okay. So with that, it sounds like, and, and thankfully, because we know how we in the fire service, we always embrace change, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, not so much. <laughs> and so we've got a bit of, it sounds like we've got a bit of a runway here. And so what would you tell fire departments? What, what, what is the best advice you can give fire service leaders, even down to the firefighter the company officer that has to um, be the inputter of data into their system, whatever that system might be across, you know, incidents and across what they do. So what, what advice would you give to all of us? knowing that we have a bit of a runway here before things will change to prepare for that and to do better today? Oh, wow. That's a big question. Um, so uh, right now, continue on with the legacy data input, right? Don't stop doing what you're doing because part of this will be a transition period. So first of all, you know, we've got to get the funding and I'm working through all of that um, and beginning to build and stand up a system. We've got to talk about the data set itself because that would be, you know, um, necessary to build the new receiver for the data. And so there's a lot of things that we have to put in place. Once the data, um, new data system is stood up with the new um, data set um, standard or the new infer standard or data standard, then we would begin to transition, right? And so the legacy system will remain until such time as we are transitioning departments over. That's going to be the heavy lift, right? Sure. Building is going to be simple. Identifying the new data elements and, and those kinds of things, that's the easier part. That's the easy lift. Transition is the difficulty. And so please continue uh, to, to input your data into the, the uh, legacy system, the existing infra system, until such time as you are transitioned um, to a new system. Because we will hold those data. There's nothing happening to the legacy data. It will be archived. It will be crosswalk and accessible for analytics. Nobody is losing any data. And so I think that's really important for people to understand. So please continue uh, status quo, what you are doing uh, right now with the data input until such time as you are identified and began to transition over to the new system. 
once we have departments who are on the legacy system transitioned, um, then we will begin to shut down the old system. And I don't know how many years that is from now. Um, so we'll we'll play that by ear as we see how quickly we can move and literally stand up these data feeds by API, because it's not just our system that is a legacy system. It's every local fire department, right? right. There are right. a few that are starting to use and begin to understand data pushes via API and reducing that burden of data entry. But there are a lot that won't understand that readily. Um, they know how to use their phone. And so we're, we're hoping to be able to do you know, some apps uh, along with this or that the vendors will step up and do apps along with this for, you know, for much more streamlined data input and push into the system. So there's just a lot of things we have to think through um, in order to make this happen. So not going to be instantaneously. So maintain status quo until uh, further information. And, and uh, I'd add too, and again, as we connect, you know, and the, you mentioned vendors, and this is going to be a good segue to the next question, but I'd, I also try to incorporate Status quo, yes, but still do a good job with your enforce. Take the time yes. to yes. do a good yes. incident report. It does matter. People do see it, whether it's local, state, or national. It does matter. And try to explain. I try to explain the whys behind it so that you, you know, yeah, it's going to take you a few extra minutes to do it right, but it's worth it. And so that same mindset needs to carry over with anything that's going to be new. Yes, absolutely. Data matter. And Please just yeah take the time to be quality. Uh, we know you don't want to have the windows open and, and do multiple things, but it does matter. And I'll go back to the example that you said, and um, I won't say what city it is. No, though. don't <laughs> talk about talk about the city. You know who it is. Um, but major metropolitan city, where when we began to evaluate their data over multiple years, in fact, we looked at twelve years of in first data. And it showed that 97% of their fires were cooking fires, 97%. And when we went to, and by the way, that doesn't open the fire module. So technically it's not an actual fire, um, right? If you, that, yeah, so not a, technically, right? right. So um, it doesn't show up as an actual fire. So when I showed this to the fire commissioner and showed them the number of actual fires they had because of the fire module being completed, then he goes, that's not right. And I said, he said, we make thousands of fires a year. Sure. That's not right. And I said, well, I didn't make it up, right? This was put, you, you guys put this in, right? And he said, but that's not right. Well, that's the difference, right? In this, where they have massive fires, but when they go back and somebody chooses, you know, cooking fire food on the stove and it was suppressed, you know, there was no, no extinguishing agent <laughs> that recorded because it wasn't in the fire module. And so this is uh, this is the problem with the data. Yeah. That's why I say to you today, we can't tell our story accurately because our data are um, not sufficient quality to do so. Yeah. So get better with what we've got now. Do better so that you have that mindset and those habits when something new evolves that 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 concept of high quality and excellence in data will carry over when we have something new. And so the new system, OK, whatever form it takes it won't start off behind. Correct. Yes. So vendors. Okay. So what role do you see vendors playing in the months and years ahead? And I'm coming at this from, you know, an enterprise training manager here at first do, but I know our mindset is very one customer centric, um, a partner mindset that we want to support endeavors that go on at state national levels, whether it's, you know, the United States fire administration, NEMSIS, things like that. And so what, what can we do, right? What 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 role do you see vendors playing in the inevitable transition? You know, I think. Sorry, my light went out. Hold on. It's okay. It's the green building, right? <laughs> so yeah, that's the green building. Um, so I think that you know vendors should be prepared to be agile, to be prepared to assist with um, API. Um, whether it is taking a data feed or a data push from CAD that you already have, then the vendor be able to via API push it somewhere else. Um, that's going to be important. And whether or not um, you know the the vendors reprogram to the new data standard, which I think is going to be a must-have. Um, that's going to be something you'll need to be alert to. Okay. Be prepared to do. 
Um, the other thing is that I think, you know, start to think about simple applications that would help with that. As I said to you, part of our problem, I think, is, is that we've got to get to a computer and do the data input. And that's a problem because a lot of even our volunteer agencies, they don't have computers. Right. Some them carry a phone. Sure. Right? So we have got to think about simplifying and using technology to simplify data entry. So for the limited data input that will re be required, then I think that, you know, for the vendors to start thinking about developing applications um, that can push data via API as well. Okay. Yeah. And, and that, that getting as much populated from outside sources, CAD, weather, traffic cameras, um, yes. Twitter, Twitter feeds, anything that can yes. help support the, the completion and the picture that you're going to be painting in an incident report. Um, we know, you know, we, we go from manually entering all of our data to having a CAD interface in departments. And it's a, you know, hallelujah moment because now doing an incident report is, is cutting 50, per, you know, cut in half. Right. And so right. then that that's going to even happen more. Um, it sounds like as we move, to, move into the future here with what we're going to be doing then to report at a national level, does that, does that sound right? It's spot on. Um, you've got to be able to receive data from multiple data sources and aggregate it. Um, and so that is, it's imperative, right? I can't say enough about that. Response data alone is not enough. And so one of the things that um, I will say to you, weather is a must have, that's a, a foregone conclusion. You've got to be able to geocode immediately. So whether you geocode coming off CAD or you geocode it through a gate that we'll have, you know, whatever um, that might be, but geocoding is, is not a, a luxury anymore. It's a must have. Must have. Uh, yeah, so that is something else. Any kind of, if you can take, and this is where we could get into some, you know, data discussion about structured versus unstructured data and, and all of that geeky thing, you know, that we like to talk about, right? So right. Um, being able to take, you know, camera feeds from whoever is calling in, um, you know, being able to scan a barcode uh, on somebody's, you know, um, driver's license or whatever to do automatic data input, you know, things like that are going to be necessary, I think, for vendors. So think um, beyond where you are today to the art of the possible and how we can capture data. And I think that's the difference. Data capture versus data collection, right? Data collection means I've got to have somebody do some input. Right. Sure, it means there's a data source that I'm going to leverage. And so I think that that's the difference, that vendors really need to be thinking creatively and not just um, you know, being able to take feeds via API, but have an API that will push data as well um, and aggregate and, and all of those sorts of things. So yeah, you it's it's time for us all to be creative and come into the arena of technology where other industry partners are. Sure. And if I'm a chief, right? If I in this as we and again, this is a transition. So I'm thinking ahead again. But if I'm a fire chief, if I can say, guys, the quantity of data that you need to collect is now being captured. So what you are collecting, let's step up the quality, guys. Absolutely. Yeah, the little piece that remains, and I'll give you an example of that. So uh, exposures. Um, now, mm. Firefighter exposures, we have to have that. Now, our partner over at NIOSH with the cancer registry. Yep. Right now, they call and they said, can you get the data feed off of infers, right? for the cancer registry so we can match incidents that are coming in. And I said to them, I can give you 2019. Well, if I've got firefighters that are doing exposure modules, right, that's not gonna match, first of all. So once we are live, that is a data feed we will share is with the NIOSH and the National Cancer Registry. So we get incident level exposure data, right? I can at least know who was on the call, you know, and, and for what duration. So that's incident level. But I think the vendors need to think about exposure tracking at the individual level. That's a much more uh, granular data point, right, that we're going to need. Um, and the firefighters are going to need that. And so having an exposure tracker, another module I'll tell you, is an instant investigation module. Mm. Because our investigators have been creating their own for so long. Um, maybe states have their own or whatever, but I can tell you almost nobody's using, you know, infers for incident investigation. Truth. <laughs> and so you're going to need, we need something for incident investigation that can push. We can match incident numbers. 
um, you know, in real time and be able to have that additional data push uh, via some sort of, uh, you know, app, but via an API as well. So, so if I'm hearing correctly, couple off the top of my head that I know apps that you're going to need to develop. And if I'm hearing correctly too, those that exposure tracker data, those data elements will be part of the national data set um, down the road. And will will it include behavioral health as well? Those eight when we respond to those atypically stressful events, you know, that, that structure fire, multifamily housing where children die, or pediatric drownings, mass shootings, um, will that be part of it as well? I think it has to be. Right? Is that not part of our story? We worry so much, and I certainly my entire career have worried about firefighter health and safety, but typically it was about their physical health and safety, cancer, cardiac arrest, you know, sure. all those things. But if we don't pay attention to behavior health um, and the traumatic event exposure that is ongoing, um, you know, as much as we do the physical ailments, then we, we are not doing our job. And so absolutely behavior health will be a consideration. I think behavior health, you know, the traumatic event tracking, um, certainly our cancer and carcinogenic exposures, um, all of those things, hazmat, uh, you know, things that we can think through um, that have an impact on our responders, it must be included. All right. And then I know when you mentioned investigations, um, that's going to be music to some of my, uh, my co- colleagues' ears across the, across the country that are always seeking s- something that is more substantive for inv- arson investigations. And so that's, uh, that's going to be very promising to many. Yes. And they know the arson investigators are fire marshals. They know what they need. They know what data need to be collected. And like I said, many of them have developed their own forms and they use, they, have. they know. And so um, given that we want to be relevant to the need. And again, not everything. What is the must have information? We don't want to be unwieldy, but what must you have to make a decision to tell the story? You know, what is the purpose that we need to, to use, for which we need to use the data. And so that's where we want to be very uh, cognizant of need. Okay. Sounds like some ex- um, exciting uh, times ahead for the American Fire Service. I hope so. Uh, I, I'm excited, uh, as I said, and USFA, uh, we, are, we are all uh, uh, excited to get moving and to do some new initiatives and really be relevant Um, to the fire service. You know, since I I came in, one of the things that I've said from the very beginning to my crew is that we have to be mission driven. And so given our mission, which is to support and strengthen the fire and emergency services so that they are available and capable of responding to all hazards. And so that's, that's paraphrasing, but that's our mission and we have to be mission driven. And this data piece is a massive part of that as to be able to make sure that you can strengthen support and have the ability to analyze your own information and to have the capability to have insights in your own data at the local level for decision-making. Yeah, the mission-driven mindset, I think that that's very appealing to almost all of us that grew up in the fire service, that sense of service above self, that sense of purpose, right? Um, being part yes. of something greater than yourself. I think that, that to me defines being mission-driven. So we talked a lot about data and the future of data management, data capture, data collection um, in our business. But what else is going on with the United States Fire Administration that you want to share, you know, in the few minutes we have left? Well, we certainly have a lot going on at the National Fire Academy. And uh, during the COVID uh, period, you know, when we couldn't bring a lot of folks on campus or any folks during some period of time, um, we were, the Fire Academy was very agile to do a lot of online learning modules. And so those are not going to stop. So we want people to engage. We also pushed a lot of content down to our state and local partners for training. So look for opportunities uh, for, you know, attending the National Fire Academy, but maybe in your own state. Um, so with some of our curriculum. So that is exciting. We are looking at new um, DEI initiatives. Um, not only on campus and new training for professional development in that space, but also pushing that kind of cultural change uh, into the fire service. And so looking at making sure that just because, you know, uh, you have people that you are leading who are not like you, but being a better leader, being a professional, and often leaders struggle with that, um, leading people who are not like them. And we want to help them overcome that through professional development and looking at soft skills and in training leaders. Mm -hmm. That's another exciting initiative that we have going. We're also looking at, um, you know, 
increasing our EMS capacity because right now we do some EMS curriculum, but it is not, in my opinion, uh, and, and I think the fire service's opinion is sufficient to where it should be. And so building up our EMS assets and resources inside the USFA and making sure that we are addressing the majority of the calls, um, certainly that sure. the is making today. And so we'll be building those up. And then uh, finally, the, the wildland, as I mentioned earlier, so uh, wildland and WUI, and WUI is really where we live, that, that urban interface right. that USFA sits. And we will continue to partner and work with you know, USDA and uh, the Department of Interior, Department of Energy, and on and on the list to make sure that the fire services uh, representation in those groups uh, is sustained. Well, I'm going to um, just do a plug for the National Fire Academy because I was blessed to go there for our visit and take on, on-site classes five times during my career. And um, I know there's going to be, you know, the hybrid where you're online and, and all of that with COVID and everything, but uh, anybody listening that has not been to the National Fire Academy, you need to go. Um, it will it will make you feel even more of a professional. It's a, um, if you haven't attended college or thinking of attending college, it it puts you in that mindset in that environment. The one class I took there, organiz- organizational theory and practice, mm-hmm. it prepared me for my degree better than anything else I, I took. And so it's just it it's a wonderful part of what our community has to offer. And uh, again, I'm just. I'm unabashedly a fan. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. That was a great plug. So, yes, please apply. Oh, and if I may, anyone who wants to teach, we are always looking for talented mm. doctors. So, please, um, that is something you're going to be hearing a lot more about is uh, our instructor recruitment. And so, uh, we are we're going to be focused on, as I said, today's environment, today's needs, today's hazards. What do you need as a, a professional in the fire service? Fire and EMS services. And so we are focused on being relevant in that space. And so we're going to need instructors who do the same. Outstanding. Dr. Lori Moore Merrill, this has been a terrific conversation. It's been exciting and inspiring knowing what's coming down the, the road for the American Fire Service. And uh, we're going to be watching closely. And again, I know speaking on behalf of, you know, first do we want to be a partner in making um, these changes successful and helping um, the fire service frankly, just do, do better when it comes to data and uh, the other things that you, the initiatives that you have um, also sound exciting. So you know you're, you have a busy schedule. We're going to uh, close out right now, but thank you um, for taking time. And I look forward to seeing you in person at a conference in the hopefully near future. I hope so, Tom. Thank you so much for having me. And, and we're excited to, to come alongside the fire service. So let's stay engaged. Absolutely. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you.